Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I am David. Um, in my <laughs> hi Jamal. Um, in in my uh, normal life, I, I work on FR routing. Um, but this talk is very much motivated by my experiences running conference networks. So that's why it says RAMS networks for hackers here. Um, so by that, I mean conferences uh, like the CCC conference with 15,000 attendees who all try to break the network. So we need proper access switches. And when I say access switch, um, let's clarify what that means. Um, essentially, what we consider access switches when we build those networks is anything that is directly connected to a user's laptop, desktop, VoIP phone, point of sale system, info display, access points sometimes. Um, it's really defined by its function. So you won't find those at home, you won't find those in a data center. Um, those are relatively specific to, well, let's say, enterprise, campus, networks. Uh, universities have them in their network when people bring their stuff. Whether the hosts that are attached belong to the same owner or a different owner doesn't really matter, um, but is, that is the general idea. So we are looking at devices that have typically gigabit Ethernet ports, um, Nowadays, it's nbase T for access points. Uh, they do have uplink ports. They normally have PoE support. And um, they are reasonably cheap devices. Um, 200 euro is perhaps a bit low, but that's, that's the cheapest you can get devices of this class if you try and save every euro, so to speak. Um, it's, it's a very different situation to, to other setups. So in, in a data center, you normally have um, at least some level of trust that your VM host is not going to try and break your switch. Um, you have a limited set of, of tenants normally. Um, in some cases, you completely trust the tenant. In some cases, you don't. And then you tend to partition them. So the key difference is also the ab absence of that partitioning. So an access switch will, in some situations, see 10 different devices from 10 different users. and each of those users owns their own laptop, and that is not a situation that you have in a data center. You would separate them in a, di in a different VLAN or something like that. Um, it's also a bit of a subset for, uh, in relation to telecom service provider switches. So those tend to have way more management features in terms of connectivity fault management, uh, OAM, stuff like that. Um, they occasionally need the features described in here as well, and um, let's start with access switches, and maybe at some point we can move to service provider switches. Um, in a way, an access point is a switch as well. So um, it does contain bridging logic. Um, so I'm not going to focus on that here, but some of the considerations apply to a, a Wi-Fi access point interface as well. Um, and um, yeah. So um, I've kind of ordered this talk in terms of ascending uh, complexity of the issues to solve. Um, I am very much a user land person, um, so please don't crucify me uh, if I get something wrong about the kernel. And um, a lot of the suggestions I'm making are really aimed at user land implementations. Um, that doesn't mean everything should be implemented in user land, um, but uh, the, the approach and the necessary uh, points that we need to attach to are in the end the same. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna suggest like ways to, to go about this. Um, oh. I've looked at some of them. I don't have patches out for this or anything. So I'm trying to solicit input and try and find the best way to go about some of these things. And um, let's get going. So the, the simplest thing that an access switch needs to do in pretty much all cases is uh, limit broadcast storms, limit uh, bump flooding, um, and that's pretty much the simplest feature you, you can ask for on an access switch. Yet, we currently, as far as I know, don't have a standard way to configure that if we have Linux on a con control plane for some switch fabric. So what we would need here is just to expose some way to, to set up the, the silicon's ACL or whatever, uh, such that we can enforce a limit in um, on per port outbound broadcast traffic, multicast traffic, unknown unicast traffic. Um, there is a bit of a complication here in that none of the TC filters can match on unknown unicast traffic as far as I know. I might be wrong. Uh, by the way, if you want to 
uh, say something, just uh, raise a hand or something, uh, interrupt me at any time. Um, so the, 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 the limiting the unknown unique cost is kind of what makes this a little bit difficult. Um, but considering the, the simplicity of the feature, it's probably possible for the switches to just expose something uh, through either SysFS or Netlink where you can specifically configure a limit for broadcast, multicast, and unicast. So that's why I'm saying custom queue disk here, which, which is probably not the best idea, but something like that that is specific to the, uh, to the driver of the switch um, and that you just set from user space. Um, right. Um, does, well, I guess. Um, the next harder feature, I guess, is um, just limiting the learning that the switch does. So um, since we are in a normal, uh, well, access network here, uh, we don't have control plane propagation of, of MAC addresses. So we very much need to do learn from the data plane. Um, but operators generally don't want to have users create an arbitrary number of MAC addresses behind the port. So I've looked around and tried and find the FDB settings or something where we can limit the, the MAC addresses that we learn per port. I haven't found them. Does, does anyone know of the existence of anything like that? There, there isn't. No, there isn't. And I, is this something port security related or just is it something port security related? I know there's um, a port security feature which is not present in the bridge driver today, but uh, it limits number of. I, I wouldn't put it under port security. It's more like network security. So mm -hmm. it's not about authenticating specific devices to mm -hmm. allow them on the network. Mm -hmm. It's just preventing um, a malicious user or even a malfunctioning device from uh, flooding on one port a huge number of MAC addresses thus breaking the entire network. So okay. it, it needs to enforce at the network edge that, for example, a reasonable port limit would be 16 MAC addresses per port. And you wouldn't specify them, you still learn, and people can still plug in other things, and you're not doing 1x or anything like that for uh, authentication. Yes. Um, so... Um, there is a question. Yeah, so yeah. you listed eVPN. Why no eVPN? Um, because you still need to learn the MAC addresses of the user's devices. So you can run eVPN towards the core of the network, but the user's laptop is not going to do a BGP peering with you and tell you it's MAC address, right? Well, just run eVPN on the access switch and then use that to limit the MACs coming in, right? Um, but the, the user can still plug in some device and uh, flood the access switch with a thousand MAC addresses. Or well, something. I guess what I was saying is add a, add a filter on Zebra to limit the number of MAC addresses coming that, up. That might protect the eVPN domain, but it doesn't protect the switch itself. Switch Fair learning, enough. yeah, the bridge will still learn. Yeah. I think. So, um, if you're going to do port limiting or MAC limiting, you have to be very careful, right? Because if, if you otherwise end up in a situation where you are indiscriminate about which one you drop, you could end up dropping the one that needs to be able to log in so that you can stop the flood. So, uh, you have to, I think, end up create a whitelist or something and then go from Yeah, th that's what I mean with operator policy may have additional input on the slide. Yeah. It's so, um, the, the, this is really up to configuration and, and policy of the network. And um, if, if the network knows its devices or classes of devices, so if you know you have Cisco VoIP phones or something like that, then the switch could be configured to always accept a particular block of Cisco MAC addresses or something like that. But that, this is highly specific to the particular setup that you're running. And to get back to a conference network, in that case, we don't have any preference in which devices get on and which are refused. We just want to prevent um, an arbitrary number of MAC addresses to flood the network. Um, so for this specific problem, I'm not sure what the best way to go about uh, approaching it is. Um, I guess we need some kind of integration with the FDB. Um, I suppose I would want to implement the policy in user space so the operator can have additional knobs on this. Yeah, so 802.1x that you mentioned previously. So there is a feature without 802.1x to do the exact same thing, not limit. So basically limit the number of Macs. And oh. 
some of the developers in host host APD, right? Host APD were considering not skipping the dot one mm. x, but just uh, snoop packets and only add um, basically the stop learning on the bridge, mm. snoop from user space and add just right. the limited ah, number okay. of packs. So That's I definitely option. I definitely need to look at that. Yeah, it's not implemented though. It was just no. discussed recently. So okay. <laughs> Cool, um, but it's it's nice to hear that there's discussion ongoing about the topic. So, cool. so skipping to the next topic, <laughs> um, who here knows what MVRP is? One hand, <laughs> two hand, three hands. So um, the IEEE has a whole list of protocols on the Ethernet level. Um, MVRP is designed to propagate VLAN memberships across a network. So if you have an access switch and the access switch is configured by the operator to hack to carry VLAN 100 on some port, then MVRP can propagate that information towards other switches. And as soon as MV MVRP establishes that there is more than one device in the network that is configured for a VLAN, you get that VLAN throughout your network. Uh, by itself, this is... Um, something that can easily be done with a daemon in user space. However, there are a few problems in the details, um, which is that um, I would I've looked at implementing this, and I would really like to get a protocol value on the VLAN membership uh, uh, subscription on the bridge's VLAN filtering database. Um, so the, the idea here is that um, if we have MVRP in operation, um, we kind of need to distinguish between VLANs that were added to the filtering database by MVRP on specific ports, as opposed to user config or even LLDP or 802.1x, both of which can also add VLANs. So if you have 1x and the radio server tells you to put the user in a specific VLAN, then that is also something that MVRP needs to pick up on. Um, so this is a really simple thing, I guess, I hope. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have a patch for the FTB, right? FTB to add a proto field in the FTB for the same reasons like for EVPN installing FTB entries. Yeah. So this year asking for VLAN, per yeah. VLAN. Yeah, so per okay. VLAN port uh, status. So it's not per VLAN on the bridge, it's okay. per, per port that carries VLAN. the VLAN with the tagged or untagged information and yeah. How's that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And for VLANs because for the same reason, people mm. maybe that serves the same purpose, right? To recognize um, well, owners. Well, the, the thing is a VLAN on a, on a bridge um, can on one port be configured by the user and on another port be uh, added by MVRP. So this is not a property of the VLAN, so in, an, an alias of the VLAN wouldn't help for this case. Okay. Okay. Um, right. So this sounds pretty easy. Um, someone needs to write a patch. Maybe that's me. <laughs> um, there's another problem with MVRP. Um, I hope people are aware, of, are aware of the group forward mask that is currently there. The MVRP address is not covered by that. Um, neither is the CDP address, by the way. Um, so there is a bit of a problem here in that we need to be able to pick up uh, specific traffic and prevent it from being bridged. Um, the, the only, well, the only way to get close to that I found in existence is uh, EBTables B route, which I'm not sure is a good idea to, to use for this functionality. Um, I would hope that we can move in the direction of a TC action or something that punts down frames, and I'm going to talk about this much more later when I've gone through the traffic inspection features for ARP and DHCP and so on, because it's kind of related on the same thing. Um, Right. So, a uh, quick, quick point on that. So, if you're using B route or TC, it assumes that you're, it's basically forward unless told not to, right? You're going to install a negative filter later. Yeah. But if I understood the group forwarding thing, it was meant to prevent accidentally merging VLAN domains, isn't it? Uh, no, no, no. no. The, the group forward mask is designed to um, make sure that, for example, LLDP and STP frames are not propagated through the bridge. Oh, that's what it was. So, I, I, okay, then remind me of a different problem, uh, the solution of the different problem, which is I have a user-specified 
VLAN 20 because I just pulled one out of thin air. But MVRP now put another port in, in VLAN 20 and I've just merged my broadcast domains. How do I prevent that from happening? Um, if, if you have this situation happening with access switches on, on, an, on a network, you would either, so if you have a loop, you would rely on the broadcast controls or STP. Um, there is no, no feature that I'm aware of that gives you a specific warning or anything like that if, if you accidentally merge two different VLANs or something like that. I mean, it, it certainly could be done, but I, I just don't know of any commercial or otherwise vendor that has this feature. Um, I do, well, we've already moved into, into loop detection here. So um, the first thing here is just, well, long-standing shortcoming of the bridge code, which is that we only support one STP state per port. And um, that's really uh, not sufficient to implement MSTP. Um, the MSTP divides the, the VLANs that the bridge carries into up to 16 STP instances. So that's what the MSTI is. That's the I is instance. Um, so you kind of need that to claim full MSTP support. You also need it for ITU GA8032 support, which is ring protection from, uh, from the ITU. Um, so that, that, that protocol is on, on the boundary between access and service provider networks, and it has a control VLAN, which is separately controlled, and you could slash should slash maybe would implement that with a different instance. Um, we are also short of um, different loop detection protocols that are still used, which does actually include the, the diagnostic protocol that was specified in the original Ethernet specification from 1982. So as a note, that operators generally don't trust STP that much, so they like to have other options. Um, with all of this, um, it's a discussion of extending MSTPD in user space. Um, I'm not sure what the general, general belief and agreement on the kernel STP implementation is. I guess it's deprecated. I hope it's well, deprecated. The, it probably can't be removed due to compatibility f yeah, considerations. But, yeah, I think most people use the user mode helper and yeah. run it because there is an RSTP implementation and an MSTP implementation. Yeah. So may, maybe it's 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 uh, late enough in the removal or something to make it even harder to use the kernel implementation or something like that, um, just to deter pre people from using it. Um, but that said, regardless of that, um, having some way of mapping VLANs to, to MST IDs is really uh, yes. useful. And unfortunately, that brings with itself, again, hardware limitations, because not all hardware supports multiple instances, especially on low-end devices. So we probably need to represent that too. But um, it's, it should be a solvable problem. Um, let's get to the really interesting part. Are, are you interested in working on the user space STP? <laughs> um, I've, I've looked at it. Okay. Um, I've, I started implementing MVRP. Okay. Um, I, I believe that MSTPD already has support for the instances, but it just can't install them in the kernel. So Yes, for the VLAN aware, so yeah. the VLAN filtering bridge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is the, the most complex and also the last part of the presentation. Um, so SAVI is the ITF name for all of the inspection features that access switches do um, to provide an additional layer of uh, security on, on their end user facing uh, hosts. Um, the point of this is to, to make the network work a little bit better in the absence of the isolation between the end users. Um, so this is what it looks like on the commercial switch, just to make things a little bit more uh, graspable. Uh, this is the DHCP snooping table on my home switch. Um, I have two hosts connected, and the switch just uh, inspected the DHCP packets th that f float through it. Um, you can see down there that... Um, Where's the... Yeah. There is a configuration to uh, set up which ports to trust. So. On this particular switch, you configure both the server IP for DHCP as well as the port where it's allowed to be attached. So the switch will prevent um, DHCP server operation from, from any other port. Um, it, will, it, will, it will also check the IP address of the DHCP server. Um, not all switches do that. It's a bit di divergent. 
and um, it will. Uh, this particular switch will also make sure that um, ARP cannot be used to steal addresses from other people if they were assigned by GCP. So, in general, switches will have um, some kind of configuration for trusted ports, like I just pointed out. Um, how that looks depends on the setup. Um, th it needs to be configured by the, by the, uh, by the operator. Um, this can also be used to feed into uh, what Srijit uh, brought up about um, port MAC uh, limits. So if you know that a port has a particular MAC address that was assigned an address, um, you can prefer that address over other addresses when you notice that the limit is being reached and you need to remove some addresses. Um, so this doesn't ex inspect any IP or IPv6 data packets um, because as soon as the switch has ensured that ARP and ICMPv6 cannot uh, be disturbed to, to disassociate the IP address from the MAC address, the remaining checking can be done on the router for the subnet. So this is only really neighbor management traffic. We are not talking about inspecting actual data traffic on the switch here. So for IPv4, this entails checking the HCP. It also entails modifying the HCP. So there's uh, option 82, which is an ITF uh, RFC where DHCP requests from clients are extended with the number of the port that re the request came in on. Um, so that means the switch modifies the packet inside of the bridge. Um, and it does control ARP. So it can do that in, a, in combination with DHCP tracking or it can also do just first come first serve. Uh, for IPv6 it's pretty much the same thing. Um, except the router advertisements are now being controlled uh, in addition to DHCP. Send is a nice standard that didn't really go anywhere. So um, the idea of send is that you have a cryptographic key and you put the public key in the IPv6 address and then the host can prove that it actually owns the address. And I don't believe it's used anywhere, but in theory, it would be checked by the switch as well. Um, and with IPv6, there's also sometimes a use case in limiting the number of addresses per port because otherwise clients can just use arbitrarily many uh, IPv6 addresses, which can also break the network in some cases. Um, from an implementation point of view, if we want to do this, we need to have some way to pick out all of the ARP, DHCP, ICMPv6 traffic and somehow shunt it to uh, the savvy implementation. Um, for DHCP, we need to be able to modify the packets. Um, that is not the case for ARP or ICMPv6 or anything like that. And um, there is a need to, to, to continue the, the forwarding path somehow, uh, which I'm gonna come to later. Um, actually here. <laughs> so um, there's two stages of filtering involved here. We first need to make sure that the switch silicon isn't just forwarding the traffic. Most of this traffic is broadcast traffic, so the silicon would just flooded out and it would never even go through the Linux kernel. Um, so I am assuming that the best way to do this would be through the offloading that TC can do. So we install an ACL in the switch silicon as a result of a TC rule. Um, then, and that is, as far as I've looked at the code, actually the harder part is we need to put in the bridge path somehow a way for specific bridged packets to be intercepted at ingress, uh, probably maybe with a TC filter again, maybe with a new action or something like that. Um, and then it needs to go into SAVI. And the SAVI component then needs to be able to somehow continue delivering the packet. Um, the continuing delivering the packet is unfortunately harder than it seems because um, in some cases, even though these are broadcast packets, we may want to limit uh, distribution of them, i.e. if we know that a DHCP server is connected to a specific port, or we only want to forward requests to that specific port. And also for a violation case of the rule, we generally, if we receive an offer on a user port, i.e. there's a DHCP server there, we don't want to forward it to other user ports but we want to forward it to the network core so it can be intercepted by monitoring software. So it's a bit of a complicated problem. Um, I came up on 
I guess several different ways this could be done. Um, there is an FQ, which kind of does this thing for NetFilter. So you put the, the you hand over the, the packet to user space, you keep a reference on the SKB. User space can then tell you, well, drop it, forward it, uh, it can also modify it. Um, but it's kind of, so the advantage as, as well as disadvantage, I guess, is that you're keeping the SKB around with any extra data and you just continue the, the kernel path if user space decides to continue with the packet. Um, we could also go for something like the B route approach. So the TC filter could result in a packet that is being matched by it uh, to, not, to, to simply not be bridged. So there's the bridge input uh, hook where B route is also t uh, cabled in, uh, connected in. So in this case, what it would happen is that the packet just gets delivered on the bridge port member interface instead of being bridged through. Um, for, we could also just emulate um, the forwarding in user space if we, for the part where we need to continue uh, with a packet and restrict its forwarding. And the probably most complicated and least likely solution would be to support injecting a packet on the bridge, i.e. have some way for a packet to be handed to the kernel on a bridge port, but in the ingress direction i.e. if I have SWP0 and um, I just intercepted an ARP packet from there, um, I hand it back to the kernel as if it arrived on SWP0, but it needs to continue upwards into the bridge after the point where it was filtered off. Um, the, the, the primary reason I'm even mentioning this, uh, this possibility here is um, that uh, the 802.1ag CFM machinery kind of needs this feature as well, because for, for um, the connectivity fault management, you have um, a functionality where you can uh, try and debug a link by pretending to inject a packet f from a particular bridge port in the direction towards the bridge. Um, then again, I'm just, this is just trying to brainstorm how this could be done. Um, yeah, the, the, if, if we do anything kernel-based where we do it re-inject the, the packet to the bridge as if it were uh, received on a particular bridge port. I believe it's gonna be pretty hard to restrict the forwarding to, to some set of ports. Um, at least I'm not sure how I, how I would do that. Um, and between this whole list of possible approaches, I have absolutely no idea which, which would work best. Um, I do think that using TC as an infrastructure is probably the way to go. Um, I suppose it needs a new action. Um, that action could st straight up be a user space interface, or it could be a B route equivalent. So we drop down to the bridge port member. Um, yeah, complicated. This. David. Um, so I, I thought about using eBPF. Yeah, I, I know you don't have much time left, but do you still have more slides? Um, the remaining slides are kind of optional. Okay, um, I mean, it sounds like you want to uh, buffer a packet and make it re-inject as if it's coming back from the same port, right? Yeah. So this stuff is done. Wouldn't uh, the IFB device, for example, help you? You redirect to it, you read your policies there, and then it gets re-injected back on the stack. You don't mm. want to queue it, right? You just want to treat it, right. to some, give it some treatment. But it needs to arrive from the original port yeah, on the bridge. Yeah, it, it will show up like it came through the original port that, again. Okay, that, that might work. I haven't looked at that option. So for, for picking out the packets, I did look at uh, BPF. Um, the problem is that we need to install this in the ACL as well, in the switch silicon. So I think that it's probably better to just use uh, Flower for that. So we just pick out all of these DHCP packets and, yeah. Um, I'm, good. I'm gonna do a quick skip through the remaining slides. Um, so I've had people from 802.11 ask about proxy stuff. So that is very similar, can use the same facilities probably. Um, and the obvious problem with the entire talk is we don't have any drivers for access switch silicon, so it's, kind of someone needs to start somewhere. 
So um, what about the all those guys like you know the Florian or huh? Oh, there is. Okay, uh, I I know there's some people who have been yeah Marvel or Broadcom even the small devices. I think these guys have been posting patches. Um, yeah, so I think the the best target for initially tackling this would be the DSA infrastructure. Um, it's kind of the devices it supports are a bit too small for access switches, but they do still support the features. And um, for some of the chips, you can da get data sheets. Um, the right device would be from Marvel, something like 98DX series, which doesn't have a kernel switch driver. Um, but yeah, maybe someone wants to do that. And um, that's the end of my slides. And by the way, can we please move IGMP snooping into user space? <laughs> we probably can allow only one question. Who would it be? Let me think. Do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I had a question, which is, uh, you had it in your last slide, why is this in the kernel? In the sense, a lot of the forwarding decisions for the access class device is not really a home router, right? It's really more, it's almost an enterprise device. So you are talking about a band, peak bandwidth that never should hit the CPU because other, you'll never be able to make that work. So, yeah. so really what we're talking about here is control structures in the kernel and, and data plane offloaded to the hardware. And I think the way to solve this problem will be to identify the device and, and the Cumulus people might have some suggestions or simulator and we can talk about a device to start from because I think a lot of it will get formed as a function of that device. Yeah, so on this slide, the TC offload, that needs to be some ACL in the silicon that picks out the traffic that we need and yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your atten attention. Thanks.